This phone cost around $50 million to develop. About 30 of those million were paid to the roughly 400 engineers, designers, and other product people working out its details. Approximately 13 million were spent to license technologies from third parties, such as paying Qualcomm for their wireless technologies and a third-party company for camera optimizations. Around 4 million were spent on just prototyping alone to fine-tune the hardware before mass production, and the rest was paid for tooling, creating molds, regulatory certifications, etc. That is a ton of money, and then on top of that, there's the actual manufacturing, the supply chain management, and everything else which will break down later as well. I just came back from London where Nothing CEO Carl Pei and his team walked me through this whole process and let me film much of it with unprecedented access. I don't think any phone company has ever given away as much information that we can learn from as Nothing told me during this trip, so without any further ado, this is a step-by-step -step guide to how to actually make a smartphone. Disclaimer, this video is partially based on information that nothing gave to me. I've used as many independent sources as I could to verify and contextualize that information, but of course the electronics industry is full of closely guarded secrets, so some stuff I just had to take at face value. So keep that in mind. Also, nothing flew me out to London and provided lodging during the trip, but no money exchanged hands, no editorial control was given over to them, and instead, this video is actually sponsored by my streaming service, Nebula. Large companies like Samsung or Apple usually start actively working on a new flagship phone around two full years before they are released. This much time is needed to develop new custom flagship technologies and to give their suppliers time to ramp up production to meet their demand of tens or even hundreds of millions of components that they'll need to deliver. That means that the Galaxy Fold 7 or the iPhone 16 series are probably actively being worked on right now already. Nothing, on the other hand, is able to keep that process to about 10 to 14 months with their phones. That is in part because they are a much smaller company, having sold around 750,000 phones since its launch about a year ago, so most suppliers can kind of just squeeze them in somewhere without much planning. And it is in part because Nothing's phones require fewer super custom solutions than the leading high-end flagships. Nothing has developed some unique things, like their glyph or their transparent designs that require a surprising amount of work to actually look good, but there are no crazy folding parts, no S pens, no self-developed chips that would have to be booked a chip fabs for years in advance, etc. Still, even their process is super complex, and for nothing, around 150 engineers, designers, and testers internally, and another 250 of their counterparts from external manufacturing partners were required during the development phase alone. The first thing those people have to do when designing a new product is coming up with a concept, and for nothing, that mostly happens in Sweden. The Swedish teenage engineering team that Nothing has been working with are responsible for almost all of their concepts, primarily through Tom Howard and Teenage Engineering's CEO, Jesper, who work somewhat independently from Nothing. Teenage Engineering are legends in the electronics space with a very distinct style, and so after agreeing with Nothing on a rough outline of what should be done, they go into their creative caves and basically return to Nothing with finished concepts that include the main design elements like transparency, the glyphs, the overall visual identity, the main materials, etc. Think of this as figuring out kind of the soul of the product, which they then hand over to the Nothing design teams in London for stage 2. The London studio is the design space I actually visited, where 17 people are tasked with turning concepts into actual products that can be manufactured, including phones and earbuds. Their job starts with figuring out the basic shapes, which they do with three different methods. First, a special foam is cut into shapes for estimating rough overall dimensions. Second, 3D printing is used if more fidelity is required. And finally, third, a CNC machine is used when the designers want to get super accurate with tight enough tolerances to test individual components. These models are used to test out how all of the components fit together and how they fit us, the consumers, in the end. And once the dimensions are figured out, the team also orders and tests individual components and material samples from suppliers to see how those all perform and how they fit together. 
Now, a lot of decisions at this stage are kind of subjective, like how big the screen should be, or what the exact corner radius of a curve should be, or how much RAM a phone needs, etc. So I asked the team how they make those decisions, and it turns out it's mostly trial and error and educated guessing. The designers and engineers just try a few things, and they pick the ones that they think will work best within the budget. Large companies typically do user testing to see what people like and what they don't, and I was told that Nothing 2 wants to do more of this in the future, like having a more active beta test community for its phone operating system, or testing earbud tuning on real users to see what they like. But given that nothing started with a team of experienced and, let's just say, very opinionated designers, they initially just focused on their own preferences to begin with. Anyway, before the actual production can start, Nothing follows the industry standard practice of having four distinct stages of prototyping. These are called T0 and EVT, DVT, and PVT, which stand for Engineering, Design, and Production Validation Testing, and the company creates a total of over 5,000 prototype devices spread across these four batches that get more and more polished as they near production. Just this prototyping alone can cost the company $4 million. At the last stage of PVT, the devices are are usually good enough to actually send, for example, to media for being reviewed. And if you're wondering why so many brands have their seemingly working devices show up on eBay months before they are released, it is likely that some of these thousands of prototypes were smuggled out of the factory by some sneaky employees. Nothing tells me that these prototypes typically have to pass 10,000 different tests by the end, and that most of the devices that they create during this process get scrapped and they try to recycle as much of them as they can. Still, there is a stark reminder that electronic products generally create a lot of waste even if the company tries to do okay. And while the hardware is built, software has to be developed too, and nothing is actually a good example of how little you can get away with as a new company. First, on the user-facing side, the company's London office, which was tiny when the Phone 1 launched, built a few widgets and some basic apps and called it a day for the Phone 1's launch, leaving stock Android to take care of everything else. Meanwhile, on the firmware and the base operating system level, they almost completely outsourced the development to their manufacturing partner. Contract manufacturers like Foxconn offer this low-level software work as a basic service, and we've seen other companies like HMD outsource this level of software development as well. This kind of outsourcing allows companies like Nothing and HMD to launch without having to build a gigantic software team from day one, but it predictably leads to kind of mediocre results, which is why Nothing has gone on a higher spree since then. Nothing has hired dozens of people from OnePlus's Oxygen OS team that was conveniently laid off a few months ago to take over the low-level work from their outsourcing partner, and they've also hired 13 developers to work on their user-facing stuff like apps and widgets on top of that, including a few key people who previously worked at Block on the Ratio launcher, so apparently Nothing OS 2.0 won't just be stock Android anymore. Now, of course, a massive focus area for any phone's software team these days is its camera with all the optimizations that it requires, and believe it or not, this too can be outsourced. There are companies who have a set of algorithms that they're willing to license and customize to any device, and nothing paid one of them a few million dollars to bring their tech to the phone one with some minor tweaks. Of course, the plan is to bring more and more of those capabilities around the camera in-house with time as well. Big companies like Samsung have many thousands of employees working on their software in-house, but it's kind of incredible how powerful and how flexible both Android and the whole supply chain has become, so a startup can just show up and pay a few million dollars and have a halfway decent version of the whole software stack put together on their behalf. So that's a rough overview of the development process, after which it's time to manufacture, which again starts with the question of how much a company should keep in-house versus how much they should outsource. If you think about it on a scale, brands like Samsung and Oppo typically make their most important devices almost completely in-house using their own assembly plants, then Apple outsources their manufacturing to the likes of Foxconn, but controls all processes extremely closely, with engineers on site and all critical decisions being made by Apple, while with low and devices, even companies like Samsung are embracing outsourcing more and more. About 70 million low-end devices like the Galaxy A3 and the Galaxy A22 
5G were outsourced by the company in 2022, typically to Chinese manufacturers, and while Samsung still controls the major decisions about what their partners make, it's often left to the outsourcing partner to figure out the details. As we've seen, nothing initially outsourced quite a lot of work to external companies, but as they grew, they are increasingly trying to bring more and more control in-house, and they now claim to have over 40 of their own employees as quality inspectors and engineers at the external factory to oversee production. Nothing wouldn't confirm this to me due to their contractual obligations, but some people digging through their operating system and looking through their components and stuff have actually figured out that their exclusive manufacturing partner is a company called BYD Electronics. If you know the popular Chinese car brand BYD, this was a spin-off from that company that now acts as an independent contract manufacturer that has also served brands like Nokia, Motorola, and to a lesser degree, Apple. Nothing uses one of BYD's factories somewhere in China, I assume in Shenzhen, and another one in Chennai, India. Nothing sells about half of its phones in India, which has strong tax incentives for domestically made phones, so that's probably why they have that factory, while most units in other markets, like my review unit here, were assembled in China as far as I can tell. Anyway, the goal with manufacturing is to first create one single working assembly line, which reliably assembles the product from zero to finished, with a clearly defined process, and then to replicate that as many times as is needed to match their desired output. Some small adjustments might be needed, like how apparently in India they need to spray vapor into the air to match the humidity that they have in the Chinese factories and to get the dust to settle better, but the goal overall is to standardize as much as possible. I was surprised to learn that Nothing actually only has a direct relationship with about 20 key suppliers like Qualcomm for their chips, Samsung for their displays and memory, and Sony for their camera sensors, while the rest are negotiated and managed by BYD, whose job is to get all the components together and to assemble them as efficiently as possible. Which actually takes us to the two manufacturing-related challenges that have killed more hardware startups than any other cash flow and supply chain management. These both sound kind of boring, but they are absolute startup killers. The phone one has over 2,000 individual components. That is a ton, and we're actually counting things like the glyph as a single thing, which itself consists of hundreds of LEDs and other things. For comparison, their earbuds, quote, only have a bit over 400 components. And as you can imagine, if any one of those thousands of components doesn't show up on time or is defective, the whole production line comes to a complete standstill. One way to avoid such a standstill would be to just order all the components in advance, but then that brings us to problem number two, cash. And to explain what I mean, let's actually make a simplified mock cash flow calculation. From a previous video that I found online from Carl, we know that the phone one's components and manufacturing, aka the bill of materials costs, was $360 at launch. As a small player, not only does nothing have to pay about 15 to 20% more for each of their components than the big guys, but they also of course get the worse payment terms, typically having to pay something like 30 days before the components arrive. So if, for example, they were to make their first batch of 100,000 units, that would mean paying roughly $36 million to suppliers before they can even start manufacturing. After the components arrive, the phones need about three weeks to be assembled and another few weeks to reach their retailers, and retailers will usually only transfer their revenues back to nothing 30 days after they sold their stock to consumers. That means that those $36 million are kind of tied up in the process for at least three months. Also, nothing will likely have to order their next batch before the first one gets sold out, so this gets multiplied, and the three months are of course way too optimistic. Our model assumed that every one of the 2000 plus components arrived at the exact same time on the exact day when the manufacturing was supposed to start. It assumes that the manufacturing itself went flawlessly and it assumed that all 100,000 units sold out on day one after hitting the shelves of the retailers. Of course, none of these are realistic, so this period actually gets longer in reality. Cash flow here refers to the problem that a company has a ton of their money tied up in these processes and even if a product is technically profitable, the company might still not be able to access the cash from that product in time. Of course, this cash flow problem is on top of the $50 million that the company has already spent on even just getting to the manufacturing phase, and it is on top of all the other fixed costs, like salaries, or paying the factory to keep their production lines running, etc. High fixed costs are like a ticking time bomb, because if their processes get stuck anywhere, revenue gets delayed too, but the employees and the factories still have to be paid. 
In other words, even with a relatively standard product like a mid-range Android phone, the company still needs a ton of cash just to survive, and they must make absolutely sure that there are no slowdowns in the process. In that light, the $150 million that the company has raised from venture capitalists, celebrities, and so on, actually doesn't seem all that high anymore. This incredible, delicate dance of all the components arriving just in time and flying off to consumers as smoothly as possible is at the heart of every hardware company, and you can really see why someone like Tim Cook, who was responsible for the supply chain of Apple, became so crucial to the company that he eventually became their CEO. And this is also why almost all the hardware startups die. If an early product isn't an instant hit, then the huge upfront development cost will never be made back and they die. If their manufacturing gets stuck for too long, they run out of cash and they die. If they can't raise money fast enough, they can't finance their huge costs and they die. Now, I've talked with Carl and the Nothing team about a ton of other things beyond just the process of making a smartphone, like whether they're profitable, why they succeeded when all the other phone companies seemingly failed, or how having multiple products impacts their business, and so on. And so I made a whole dedicated second video that you can watch right now over on Nebula. Carl and the team really gave me a ton of good info for these topics as well, so thank you again to Nothing for being this transparent, and this new video about Nothing joins the dozens of other Nebula exclusive bonus videos and Nebula originals that I've put out on the platform already. It's like Tech Altar Plus over there with way more of what I do, and other creators have their own ambitious original series as well. Wendover has just released their new Logistics of X series, next to his hour-long documentaries and his game show Jetlag, Real Engineering has just launched season 2 of the Battle of Britain series, Neo has recently released new episodes of the Incredible Under Exposure series, and the list goes on. It's all the smartest creators, but with way more content that you can't find anywhere else, no ads and early access for most of our regular videos as well. Nebula houses basically all of my favorite tech educational creators, including the newly added Branch Education, with their incredible visualizations and explanations, and Breaking Taps with his insane cool microscopic explorations and more. The platform is owned by us, the creators, and all this bonus exclusive content is only available because people like you are supporting us with your subscriptions. And if you use my link, which you can find in the description or on screen, you can actually get a yearly subscription for just 30 bucks instead of the 50 that it usually is. That is a $20 discount for tech out our viewers versus just using a generic link to sign up, so check it out. I really hope that you enjoy all the stuff that we put out there, and I'll see you in the next video.